Some, uh, a couple of weeks ago, someone asked me for the references to something I had said about the curse put on Jericho, about having to sacrifice two children if you're going to rebuild it. And uh, like an idiot, I forgot to bring in the references with me, but they are those two. <clears throat> I've been building up a pattern of imagery in the Bible, and the pattern of imagery is necessarily somewhat static as I, as I outline it. But, of course, the Bible is a narrative as well as a structure of imagery. Things happen. And I think we are at the point now where we need to examine some of the narrative structures in the Bible as well. Now remember, at almost the first lecture, we suggested that the history of Israel in the Old Testament presents a series of falls and rises where Israel <coughs> turns to apostasy and gets into trouble, is invaded or conquered by another country, and then is sent a deliverer after they've changed their minds and are brought back to something approximating their former state. And this you might represent as a U-shape of fall and rise. And I think I mentioned that that U-shape is found everywhere in the Bible, not only in the historical parts, but in uh, <coughs> such things as the book of Job and Jesus' narr narrative, a, a parable of the prodigal son. Now, we saw that there was a series of these narrative movements and that the first historical one, that is the one following the fallout of the Garden of Eden, is the descent of Israel to Egypt and its deliverance from Egypt. <clears throat> now that is the model for all the other sequences. The Babylonian captivity and the return from Babylon is thought of simply as a repetition of the deliverance from Egypt. And over and over again in the Psalms and elsewhere, uh, Jehovah says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And <clears throat> Jehovah has actually been described by a German scholar as the out of Egypt bringing God, which is the kind of thing Germans do. And uh, the, uh, the deliverance from Egypt, therefore, is the is the model for everything else that happens. Part of the reason for that is that usually the descent is an error or a sin, that is an apostasy on the part of Israel. But this is not true with the Exodus account. The Israelites seem to have done nothing wrong as far as we can see in entering Egypt. But once they got there, <coughs> the Pharaoh changed from the Pharaoh who was, to whom Joseph was an advisor to a later Pharaoh who was determined on genocide. Now, once again, the <coughs> biblical account is a story, not a history, and it is not the historical Egypt that is the furnace of iron from which Israel is delivered, but the spiritual Egypt. And <clears throat> the deliverance from Egypt, which is where the history of Israel, properly speaking, starts, is the theme of the 
book of Exodus. <clears throat> now, in a sense, the descent, whether it's caused by apostasy or not, is really not an, not an event at all. It's, uh, if it's caused by infidelity to God, it's, it's a pseudo-event, it's a failure to act. And the deliverance, consequently, is the one thing that happens. And as the Exodus is the model for every deliverance in the Old Testament, we can say that metaphorically, the Exodus is the only thing that really happens in the Old Testament, the deliverance from Egypt. And <clears throat> hence, in the Christian Bible, the Exodus would, more than any other event in the Old Testament, be the type of the most important antitype for Christians, that is, the resurrection of Christ. I've tried to show that the progression of events in the Old Testament, although it deals with historical material, is not anything that we would call a history. And similarly, that the life of Christ is portrayed in the Gospels, though it is the life of a real person, is not presented in any recognizable form of biography. The life of Christ is presented as the antitype, as the real form, the, the, uh, the real meaning of the story of the Exodus. In the first place, we begin with the story of the birth of the hero whose life is threatened. That is a story that is very much older than the Bible. It was told about a Mesopotamian king, Sargon, uh, <coughs> centuries before the time of the Exodus. And the story of Moses is that his birth was a threatened one. That is, Pharaoh Well, it's not in the strict sense of the word a massacre. Nevertheless, it is genocide. And the, and the Pharaoh of Egypt says that that all male Hebrew children that are born are to be killed. And that corresponds to the slaughter of the innocents. In the New Testament, and the two characters involved are the Pharaoh of the Exodus and Herod. <clears throat> now, as a matter of fact, there were various massacres of children which Herod ordered, and uh, one of his own sons was killed in one of them, and <clears throat> the Emperor Augustus, when he heard the news, remarking on the fact that Herod, although he was not a Jew, nevertheless observed the Jewish dietary laws, it was obviously much safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. But <clears throat> in any case, the same theme, one of these, these uh, slaughters of innocence, is identified with a particular slaughter from which Jesus escapes, just as Moses escapes in the earlier account. And you notice the, the similarity 
of Moses being concealed in what is called an ark, Katibos in the Septuagint, and Jesus being born in the manger. And then Moses, then you remember that in the Gospel account, Jesus is taken to Egypt by his I figures Joseph and Mary. <clears throat> In the earlier account, Moses grows up in Egypt. And the names Joseph and Mary recall the Joseph who led the Israelites into Egypt in the first place, and the Miriam who was Moses' older sister. In fact, there is a surah of the Koran that identifies the Miriam of the Exodus story with Mary of the Gospels. And naturally, Christian commentators on the Koran say that this is ridiculous, but we must remember that the Koran is speaking from a totally typological and ahistorical point of view, and from that point of view, the identification makes sense. <clears throat> According to Matthew, the reason why Jesus was taken to Egypt to get him out of the way of Herod was also to fulfill the prophecy in Hosea, out of Egypt have I called my son. And it's quite clear that Hosea is talking about Israel. And so that the, the uh, fulfillment of that prophecy also establishes the fact that the life of Jesus is being presented as an individualized form of the Exodus. So Moses organizes the 12 tribes of Israel and Jesus gathers 12 disciples. And then the crucial event of the Exodus is the crossing of the Red Sea, where the Egyptian army is drowned. And that is the event in which the nation of Israel is born, so that the story of Israel symbolically starts with the passing over the Red Sea. And the corresponding event in the life of Jesus is the baptism in the Jordan, where he is recognized audibly as the Son of God. And <clears throat> it is at the baptism that the two oldest Gospels, Mark and John, begin. The infancy stories of Matthew and Luke are later material. I don't mean that John is, is the oldest gospel as we now have it, but the kernel of it is, is older. And then there follows the 40 years wandering in the desert, and immediately following the baptism, Jesus wanders 40 days in the desert. The period which is commemorated in Lent and which was the period according to the Synoptic Gospels of the temptation. And by withstanding the temptation, Jesus fulfills the law, which uh, is <coughs> also the point about the 40 years in the desert for the Israelites. The law is received from the top of a mountain. 
And it is also in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, which contains the kernel of so much of the gospel. And if you look carefully at the Sermon on the Mount, you will see that a great deal of it consists of a commentary on the Ten Commandments. There is also the miraculous provision of food and similar miraculous feedings during the ministry of Christ. Now, if you look at Numbers 21, there is an account there of a rebellion of the Israelites against their leadership, and the Lord, <clears throat> who was always on the side of the establishment, sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and the people of Israel died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, so that every, every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And if a serpent had bitten any, any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to this lifting up of the serpent in the wilderness, as a type of his own passion. In other words, the brazen serpent on the pole is an Old Testament type of the crucifixion and is accepted by Jesus as that. We are then told that Moses dies in the wilderness. He climbs a mountain from which he can see the promised land, but he has already been told that he cannot enter the promised land <clears throat> because of the fact that he performed one of his miracles in a fit of bad temper. And so the, his successor, Joshua, uh, is the one who invades and conquers the promised land. Now, the hidden link in the typology here is that Joshua and Jesus are the same word. Jesus is simply the Greek form of Joshua, and consequently, the conquest of the promised land is the same thing as Jesus opening up of the spiritual promised land and his conquest over death and hell. And from the point of view of Christian typology, the fact that Moses dies in the wilderness means, among other things, that the law alone, whom Moses personifies, cannot redeem mankind. Consequently, <clears throat> when at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, the angel Gabriel tells the Virgin Mary to call her child Jesus, or Joshua, the typological meaning is that the reign of the law is now over and the assault on the promised land has begun. <clears throat> Any question that far? Well, it's not so weak when it's, it's uh, explicitly established by Jesus himself, according to the Gospel of John. In, uh, that is in John 
uh, John 3 and 14. <clears throat> and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. <clears throat> and uh, the serpent in the wilderness was uh, according to the book of Kings, actually put into the temple and became an object of adoration, but it was removed from the temple by Hezekiah, who was afraid that it would give rise to idolatry, but it obviously was a very much more important emblem in the symbolism of the Old Testament than, than the amount of space given to it indicates. <clears throat> Oh, certainly. They keep on saying so. And uh, the, the, uh, that, that is the, the whole point about the question of evidence in, in the Bible. How do we know that the story in the Gospel is true? We know it's true because it fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament. Okay, how do we know that the prophecies in the Old Testament are true? We know they're true because they're fulfilled by the gospel. <clears throat> That's the evidence. It's like a tennis game. All you do is look this way. And uh, <clears throat> that is why the gospel presents the appearance of this double mirror in which each reflects the other, but neither bothers with any external evidence at all. <clears throat> Any external evidence would imply a criterion of truth which the Bible itself does not recognize. So that if you see a television show which, which proves that somebody has been to Mount Ararat and finds that, the, that the, uh, there was a big building on top of Mount Ararat with spaces for animal cages in it, it doesn't prove that the Bible is true. It merely uh, proves that uh, <clears throat> somebody has, has been uh, reconstructing vision because the Bible itself couldn't care less whether anybody ever finds an ark on top of Mount Ararat or, or not. Uh, proofs of that kind belong to a mentality which are <clears throat> totally different <clears throat> from any mentality that could conceivably have written any part of the Bible. And similarly, if an account of Jesus' trial before Pilate were ever to turn up that corresponded in any detail to the actual account of the Passion of the Gospels, there would be a lot of people who would hail that as a vindication of the truth of the Gospel account without noticing that they had shifted the criterion of truth from the Gospels to something else. That, that won't do for, the, for, for, for this kind of thing. You have to focus your, your whole attention on the text that is given there. And, uh, <clears throat> And so the fact that the life of Christ uh, is presented in the form which makes it the antitype of the Exodus doesn't say anything about its truth or its falsehood by irrelevant criteria. It merely means that this is the right way to present it in terms of what the Bible writers were doing. Now this is the long version. There's also a short version, and the short version is even more important typologically.
you remember that I that I gave you an account of the of the quest of Christ in the Bible, <clears throat> which had him descending from metaphorically from the sky, de de Chalis, down to the surface of this earth in the incarnation, then his death on the cross, descent to hell, harrowing of hell, return to the surface of this earth in the resurrection, and the and the ascension back to heaven again. Now, that can split in two, if you like, and what we've been dealing with is very largely the parallel between the Exodus story and Christ's life in the upper air, that is, his, his descent to the Egypt of this world, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. But <clears throat> then there is this whole underworld sequence which uh, takes the three days and three nights of the <clears throat> Easter weekend, and that corresponds to the crux of the Exodus account, which consists of three main events. One is the Passover, the other the passing through the Red Sea, and the reaching the other side, which corresponds in the Gospel account to the crucifixion and death, the descent to hell, which is usually given in subterranean rather than submarine imagery, but is still the same imagery, and the resurrection from the tomb on the third day. I brought in a, a translation of an Easter hymn by St. Ambrose, which dates from the fourth century AD. And it says, For these are our paschal solemnities, in which the Lamb is slain, by whose blood the doorposts of the faithful are made holy. This is the night in which thou, Lord, didst first lead our fathers, the children of Israel, out of Egypt, and make them cross the Red Sea on dry foot. This is the night in which Christ broke the bonds of death and rose again as a victor from hell. And <clears throat> there's another hymn of the sixth century. Protected from the destroying angel on the eve of the Passover, we have been snatched from the harsh rule of Pharaoh. Now Christ is our Passover, the lamb that was sacrificed. Christ has risen from the grave, returning as a victor from hell. So that the typology on which those hymns are based is this, this uh, parallelism between the killing of the lamb as the sacrificial victim, which saves the life of the Hebrew children, the descent to hell, where, which, where the Egyptian firstborn were all killed, and later their army was drowned in the Red Sea, and then the passing through the sea, the deliverance from the water to the other side. <clears throat> Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was wondering about one of the gospel references referring to the descent to hell. Well, as I was uh, remarking earlier when I commented on this, uh, on this diagram, the, this part of the quest is, is a part which has been very largely reconstructed by later 
tradition and imagery. The New Testament evidence for a descent to hell is pretty weak, and the biblical evidence for the harrowing of hell, which it was so prominent in the Middle Ages, doesn't exist at all. That comes from, from a later work called The Gospel of Nicodemus. But uh, in the Gospel there is nevertheless room for this three-day pattern of death on the first day, disappearance on the second, and return on the third. And I've suggested that that connects with a number of other myths and legends where there is a big dragon, a hero goes down into the open mouth of the dragon and returns from there, which has been absorbed in a Christian iconography as well. Well, between, between death and reappearance, there must be a disappearance. That's, that's, the, that's the general idea. And there, we need an antitype for the passing through the, the Red Sea. And in later, in fact, in the New Testament itself, uh, in Paul's conception of baptism, for example, baptism is one of the antitypes of this exodus progression where the infant baptized is the Egyptian part of him, so to speak, is metaphorically drowned. And the redeemed part of him uh, en enters the, uh, the, the society of the redeemed. But uh, Paul continually recurs to baptism as a rite in which you die to, to this world. And uh, I think I've already called, a, called your attention to the, to the remark of Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, where he makes that parallel. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that our, all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. <clears throat> I don't know whether I've said earlier or not that uh, the Gospels could hardly insist more strongly than they do on the parallelism between the feast of the Passover and the time of the crucifixion of Christ. That's written all over the, the, the uh, Passion accounts in all the Gospels. Uh, and it contrasts rather strikingly with the time of, of Jesus' birth. Have I gone into that earlier? Um, there is no New Testament evidence whatever about what time of year Jesus was born. And uh, as far as we can see, the church seems to have been content to take the winter solstice festival from other religions. Uh, the great rival of Christianity in the early days was Mithraism, which was a sun, sun god religion. And uh, uh, in Mithraism, the most important event of the calendar was the, was the winter solstice, the birthday of the sun, which is celebrated on the 25th of December. And there are many reasons why the winter solstice date is a very good one for, for Christmas as well, but it's just possible that, that uh, the fact that there's no gospel authority for it accounts for the fact that Christianity has never established anything more than squatters' rights on Christmas, which has always been a pagan festival from the very beginning. 
Well, I'm trying to get out from under that, that either-or dilemma, which, uh, which I don't believe in. I think that, uh, that the, it seems utterly clear that the Gospel writers are trying to tell us something, and they are not trying to prevent us from knowing something else. But uh, what they are trying to tell us is what, from their point of view, really happened. Now, a historian tries to put you where the event was. If he's talking about the assassination of Caesar, he tries to make you see what you would have seen if you had been present at the assassination of Caesar. But you see, if you had been present at the crucifixion of Christ, you might not have seen what the Gospels portray at all, because what you would have seen might have missed the whole point of what was really going on. You would only have seen, an, uh, or at least that is you and I, the, everybody, would have seen only a mentally unstable political agitator getting what was coming to him. I don't think the uh, Gospels are very interested in reliable witnesses. The only witnesses they care about are the, uh, are, are the, the early group of primitive Christians that formed around the, the resurrection. And uh, they, uh, they disregard that kind of evidence of, uh, of travelers coming by and that, that sort of thing. That's what a biographer would pick up, but the Gospel writers are not biographers. And uh, uh, it seems quite clear, too, this is insisted on over and over, that there were people like Thomas who wanted evidence, and mostly the people who wanted evidence were told to read the scriptures, that is, the Old Testament, where they would get this tennis game type of, of proof. And, uh, The story of Thomas, of course, is that his desire for a visible and tangible evidence of the, of the resurrection was granted. But he was also told that if he hadn't bothered with that kind of evidence, he might have understood the, the resurrection more clearly. And what I think that means is not that an uncritical attitude is closer to the truth than a critical one. I think what it means is that the more trustworthy the evidence, the more misleading it is. What in Exodus corresponds to Judas? To Judas? Um, all the rebellions of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, the people who are swallowed up in the, uh, in the, in the earth because they, they led rebellions. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the Judah story, the type of that is not so much in the Exodus as in the prophecy of Zechariah. If you could turn to um, chapter 11 of Zechariah, it's the second last book in the Bible. Here God is represented 
as <clears throat> breaking his contract with his people. And in verse 12, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. So the, those two themes, the, the potter's field and the thirty pieces of silver, are connected or, or the, with, with this prophecy in Zechariah in which God is represented as being betrayed by his people and sold for 30 pieces of silver, which according to the book of Exodus is the symbolic price of a slave. Why is it? Uh, well, uh, among other things, the the dead body of Christ on the cross is symbolically the body of the serpent of death and hell which Christ leaves behind him. Or as Michael explains to Adam in Paradise Lost, to the cross he nails thy enemies, the law that is against thee, and, and, and the powers of death and hell. So that the, <clears throat> uh, the natural body dies on the cross and rises a spiritual body, and the analogy of that is the serpent that sheds its skin. Yes. Um, the point that I want to return to when we come to the book of Job is that no serious religion ever tries to answer anybody's questions because in any serious or existential matter, uh, the progress in understanding is a progress through a sequence of formulating better questions. And an authoritative answer blocks off your progress, it blocks off your advance. Uh, the answer consolidates the assumptions in the question and brings it to a dead stop. And that is what I mean when I say that the more trustworthy the evidence, the more misleading it is. Trustworthy evidence means a kind of authority that stops you from asking any more questions. Okay. Is that why um, law is lost in the end? You were saying that the resurrection law is given up. Is that because authority is given up? Authority. Well, in a sense, yes. That is, uh, uh, the uh, at least the general Pauline point of view on the law is expressed again by Michael in Paradise Lost when he says the law can discover sin but not remove. That is, law defines the lawbreaker, it defines the criminal, but it, uh, it can't make people better. 
and uh, consequently, <clears throat> of course, that is not what Judaism means by law by any means, but it's what Christianity means by the law which is transcended in the gospel. And, uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, the, the, uh, the law from Paul's point of view, and the author of Hebrews as well, uh, is something which becomes internalized. And uh, next term, perhaps, when we go through the sequences of things in the, in the Bible, we'll deal with that more fully. <clears throat> Well, next time I, I'd like to try to apply some of this to some of the patterns of imagery that I've been making about the 